Go ahead. You want me? Okay, this is Gary Burkross. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, sessions of the Ontology Summit uh, with its context on knowledge graphs. Uh, I'm happy today to introduce uh, Anirudh uh, Prabhu as our featured speaker to add to, uh, well, en enlighten us on our uh, knowledge um, graph topic. Uh, Anirudh is a PhD uh, candidate at my undergraduate school, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which uh, fondly is known to friends uh, with no time to waste um, as the more abbreviated RPI. Um, Anaruth is working with Professor Peter Fox at RPI, where his research interests include data modeling, uh, semantic e-science, and data visualization. Uh, Peter Fox, by the way, has been a, one of the uh, featured speakers at uh, prior sessions of the, uh, the summit. Uh, Anaruth's uh, work currently focuses on applying data science and machine learning to solve earth and environmental science problems. There's more bio information on Anne Ruth uh, provided on a link on today's uh, webpage for today's session. Now, one context for this talk uh, is NSF OKN or uh, Open Knowledge Network uh, work. And uh, we had a session uh, last year organized by Ram and myself at the summit on context in open, uh, knowledge net, uh, open knowledge networks. And so people can actually look there they're interested in that, uh, some of that discussion. Um, it was of interest to me when Anarud recently provided a walkthrough for NSF on several existing tools and technologies that are used in open knowledge networks at the January Earth Science Information Partners Workshop in Bethesda, Maryland. So that's one context. Another context is the domain that Anarud works on, which he's part of the, the Keck, the Deep Time Data Infrastructure Team and the Deep Carbon observatory data science team. As a final context, uh, we've heard a little bit about the relationships of, of knowledge graphs, KGs, the other knowledge representations and their history by John Sora. And last week, Matthew West provided a picture of that role, knowledge graph role in making information fit for purpose. So Anarudh uh, will build on that and his talk today is entitled Insights from Knowledge Graphs. So as part of that, this week we'll get a closer look at what knowledge graphs uh, are and how to understand them and getting insight from things like reasoners, analytics, and network science approaches. And with that, let me turn it over to Anna Ruth. Um, thank you, Gary. Um, I just wanna make sure, can everyone hear me clearly? I think so. It's a little right. bit low, but I can hear you. All right, all right. Um, so thank you so much for introducing me, Gary. Uh, as Gary said, my talk today is gonna to be about how to gain insights from knowledge graphs. So the first question that comes to mind is obviously, what are insights? Uh, I actually looked through some of the uh, previous session stock and I saw that this figure had been used and I really like this figure too, so I decided to use it um, at the ESIP meeting. Uh, so an insight for me uh, is anything that is not directly uh, seen in the data, right? So it's not obvious when you see it that this is new, this is novel. So anything that can be discovered that's not obviously seen, I consider an insight. And so how valuable those insights are really depends on the domain of the data and what the data contains and how valuable it is to the scientific hypothesis. Um, what we're gonna be talking here, this is probably the introduction slide for the entire talk, is how do we gain insights? So as Gary said, I'll be talking about these three approaches to gaining insights. Um, the first one is reasoners. Uh, <clears throat> reasoners are the most obvious way uh, any of us using ontologies or knowledge graphs end up gaining uh, insights from them, right? So let's say you have an ontology like this. And uh, for reference, this is an ontology that we had created in a project called Dark Data. Uh, we had worked with people from NASA, Goddard, and Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, and this is an ontology that basically is used to recommend what is the best visualization method for the data that exists in NASA, in the NASA Giovanni information system. So uh, when you have an ontology like this, there's typically two ways you can gain inferences from this ontology. The first one is you have restrictions in your ontology and then you run a reasoner to get uh, inferences. The second way is to have a rules engine where uh, experts are told to put in uh, a set of rules and create a rule base. And based on those rule bases, you can run a rules engine to then gain inferences. 
So for example, the rule that you see is an Apache Jena rule that tells us that half hourly time interval data is best for visualizing uh, hurricanes and tropical storms and other earth science events that are similar to hurricanes. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this because this is like using reasoners or rules engine is fairly commonly known to the community. So instead, what I'll be focusing on is some other methods which we can use the data extracted from knowledge graphs uh, to gain valuable insights. So the first one is obviously, uh, as you see, visual analytics. So visual analytics is the science of analytical reasoning based on uh, visual and what you see in visual interfaces, right? So uh, there are some times when you just visualize the data and patterns and trends pop out at you. Uh, when you see this, uh, it's really valuable. It's easy. Yes, you can see it, uh, but the, using the right visual tool becomes extremely important in representing your data. Um, just a quick run through. Uh, these are the tools that we most commonly use uh, for data that is extracted from knowledge graphs. So we want to represent it still in a network like uh, visualization. So you have JavaScript libraries like D3JS and VisJS. You have R packages like iGraph and Viz Network, and you have also other, you know, specially created tool like Vowl, Visualize Owl, to visualize an ontology directly. So I'll just go through them and show you a few examples of how we visualize the data and how we gain insights. Uh, the first one is Vowl. Just I won't spend again. I won't spend a lot of time because people who use ontologies are very familiar with Owl visualization tools. But what you see here is, uh, so this automatically loads up the FOF ontology. But just for reference, let me load up the dark data ontology that I just showed you earlier. And there you go. So you should be able to see the entire ontology represented. Uh, you can examine specific classes. You can see additional information about them, statistics. You can see specific properties. Uh, you can filter things, uh, you know, remove object properties or data type properties and so on, and just see how, you know, these, these how this ontology looks. Uh, but honestly, when, when I look at this ontology visualization um, and I, I look at how this rep network looks per se, uh, there's very little you can learn about the data that's in this ontology, about all the instances that are there and how they're related. Even if you do end up uh, visualizing the instances with a similar visualization tool, uh, all you can see is an instance version of the same ontology. And beyond the obvious of what you can see and how these classes are related, there's very little insights that I found valuable that I gained just from simply looking at this visualization. So that brings me to the next part, which is sort of converting, extracting the data from these uh, knowledge graphs and then visualizing them as networks. Uh, and when I say networks, I mean networks in the sense of network science or graph theory. So I'll get to some of the specifics a little later. But this is a slide I really like to use to uh, tell people about how much we can gain from this network science approach from the visual and from the mathematical side of it. So on the left, you see what can be encoded into this network. The rule of thumb we use is we, we try to encode the bare minimal information required into the network and then set the right algorithms. Uh, for example, set the right layout algorithm to see what we can learn without us explicitly encoding it into the network. So you see that for any network, we typically only encode what do the nodes represent what do the edges represent or the links between the nodes represent? And we encode, uh, encode a layout algorithm. Most of the networks that you're gonna see in this talk are gonna be using the force directed algorithm, uh, which is also called the freshman Reingold algorithm. So as you can see, based on just the minimum information encoded, you can see patterns uh, emerging in networks. You can see small groups forming, subcommunities forming in networks based on the layout. You also visually see like small pinch points or hubs emerge in these networks. And I'll show you examples of each of these. Um, so this is an example of a network we created using D3JS, data-driven documents, which is uh, a JavaScript library. So 
what you see here is a basically a live network that we have and it is a mineral network of all carbon minerals that are found on earth uh, the colored nodes that you see here are carbon minerals so if i hover on it you see it says siderite it says calcite some of the rarer minerals are here which says ansolite uh, which is a lanthanum one um, and looking at the static or the dynamic version, uh, there's a certain symmetry that you see in, in the geometry of this network. And that's, that comes to the first part about observing patterns visually. So as you can see, there's a, uh, it looks like an inverted vase of sorts where there's a symmetry on both sides. Uh, the, the bigger colored nodes, which are the more commonly occurring carbon minerals, are all clumped together while all of the rarer carbon minerals are, are spread out to the edges. And the other thing you notice is the gray nodes, which are the locality where uh, these minerals are occurring. So Arkansas, Kazakhstan, uh, I think one of these is Italy and you know, there we go, Italy. So what you notice is the, the more common minerals are occurring in uh, nodes that uh, localities that have a small mineral diversity. Right. So let me talk about the insights we gained visually from both the mathematical and the geological perspective. First, the mathematical. Uh, so this distribution that you see reflected in this network is what we call a LNRE distribution, which is a large number of rare events distribution. Uh, and so based on us finding out the distribution visually from this network, we were uh, we were able to uh, predict using the LNRE distribution how many more carbon minerals are yet to be found if, if all of the carbon minerals on Earth follow the LNRE distribution. So our collaborators have already done that. They've run the simulations and they actually have a paper out which says there are X number of carbon minerals more to be found that we have not heard of or you know anticipated. And so based on that, they also started, you know, a carbon mineral challenge where people are encouraged to go out and look as part of DCO initiative to go out and look for carbon minerals. And they uh, found 30 minerals already that were previously not found. Uh, from a geological perspective, what you see here is that the rare earth minerals, which are on the fringe here, are connected with other rare earth minerals. And they are found at localities which are high diversity which have high diversity, uh, which means that if you are going to find more minerals, you would be better off looking at high diverse locations and the minerals you're going to find are mostly going to be rare earth minerals. So what these visual analytics, what, what this visual analysis helps us to do is to find, you know, new hypotheses, new information, new insights that help us go explore uh, further. Uh, the second tool we use is uh, called iGraph. It is an R package. It's used for creating static networks, not the dynamic kind that I just showed you, but uh, it has a good, it has the complete spectrum of all the network tools, the metrics, the algorithms that are required for analyzing networks in a mathematical manner. Um, and it's very versatile in you know, handling different kinds of data structures as well from the computational point of view. Uh, also, just for reference, what you see here is a uranium network, uh, and you see with uh, the elements in purple, you see the elements in those uranium networks, and then in the colors, you see the various uranium mineral. And other than uranium being central, what, what this network is telling us is that arsenic or magnesium or copper play a more central role in uranium minerals on Earth than does something like sulfur or selenium or molybdenum. So every network will teach us something. So similar to D3JS, there's a VisJS library, which R has now wrapped into a, a R package called Viz Network. I particularly like using this package for visualizing networks because of two things. One is it's easier to deal with data structures in R than using JavaScript. And the second, the data from uh, using VisJS, the networks are far more scalable. Uh, so just to show you like a preview of how scalable the networks are. So here you have a large network of uh, 9,200 nodes and like far, far more edges. And you see that the network 
like it is trying to render out using the first directed algorithm and it's trying to settle into equilibrium and this network uh, which is a world cup network of the various teams participating the various players playing which is a large network also shows you the other aspect that i was talking about you see groups form automatically and you see how these groups uh, are present in the network geometry in the layout as far as the entire network environment goes so for example this green group and this purple group are very orthogonal to each other so you see this is the name of the player and you see additional information the it's an australian player who plays for the team melbourne victory is very orthogonal from this green section here which focuses on south korea and the teams they play for right the players that they play for while two two groups in the center which are nearer to each other may be far similar to each other even though they belong in fundamentally different countries or different groups so visual analysis really helps us understand the distribution of the data that is lying in the network environment moving on uh, what you see here this is the third part that i wanted to highlight on which was the hubs or the pinch points occurring in network what you see here is a fossil network that we had created uh, all animal families so that's it's the familia uh, part of the hierarchy and there's a few things you notice automatically so there's three fundamental groups there's sort of an axis formed here and there are these pinch points so let me first explain what the network represents every node is a fossil that co-occurs with each other and so if two fossils are found at the same geographic location then we connect them then we draw a line between them so that's what this network is representing and that's all the information that we've encoded into this network so when we examine this network further we find that these groups emerge automatically like and these groups the blue represents the cambrian fauna the red represents the paleozoic and the black represents the modern fauna right and it's important to note that we only encoded the geographical information but we see a time axis going from the cambrian to the modern so there is an embedded time axis in the network that was not encoded that we didn't know right and so we do have the time information of course but we the network does not know this and the layout algorithm does not know this but it's able to reflect a time axis so that's a valuable insight gained that you know when you encode geographically a fossil network that time axis is returned but second and more importantly you see these hubs formed these pinch points formed right there are there are these sections where a dense network gets narrow then gets dense again and then vice versa and keeps going on when we looked further into this and analyzed the data behind this we found that these pinch points represent mass extinction events and so that really was like a revelation to us that mass extinction events can be visually represented in networks and we really wanted to test this hypothesis out in you know different kinds of fossil data and maybe go for further down into the hierarchy from family to genus uh, and and examine it so here's an example of how we did that and how a hypothesis was gained is we looked at just ediacaran networks the oldest fossils you know and and found that there's a pinch point there as well as you see here and the nodes are separated into groups so the colors were based on the hierarchy the grouping that was already assigned by paleontologist but the network kind of shows you that the sec there are only two distinct group according groups according to the network even though they are divided into four colors by the paleontologist so drew musenti who was uh, one of the lead postdocs on this ediacaran project formed this hypothesis he was like he said nama and white sea fauna are different faces so there are two different faces and a mass extinction event occurred after the avalonian so we were we formed this hypothesis based on the insight we gained from visual analysis of the network and we used this then we we used this hypothesis and we proved it based on you know machine learning algorithms network metrics and so on so it's a very complementary hand in hand task but you can form hypothesis and prove them using these kind of tools so now that you've seen a preview of what we can see visually and that you can gain insights purely visually as well let's see what else we can gain from you know a mathematical standpoint 
per se. So again, these are the R packages, the JavaScript libraries that we use uh, for you know, the mathematical aspect of uh, analyzing networks. Um, so just to start off, so when you extract data from a knowledge graph uh, into a more you know, flat representation, it looks somewhat like this, right? I'm sorry. So you have, so this is you know, mineral information that was extracted, so you have mineral names, you have multiple IDs for minerals that are retrieved from various uh, original data sets. And then you have locality name, locality information, whether it is a meteorite or not. And there are many, many more attributes that exist that I just couldn't, didn't have the space to represent. So you convert this into two different kinds of data for representing it as a network. The first one is called an adjacency matrix. So every mineral that occurs at the same locality we, we want to connect them, right? So you have rows and columns here, which both represent minerals. So it is basically uh, an adjacency matrix. It's an equal matrix where uh, it's the lower triangle and the upper triangle are mirroring each other symmetrical. And so the way, the way you read this is if malachite occurs together with calcopyrite, it occurs, co-occurs 6,900 times on earth. So this is, the network connection data structure that we then represent. The other way to do it, this is a more straightforward way for human reading, is it's called an edge list and a node list. So the node list gives you all of the important information that is relevant to your visualization. So you have the name of the mineral, you have the redox state, you have the color, the luster, the hardness, for example, and this is the edge information. So uh, you have a source, a target, so the two types of two nodes, and then the value, the strength of the connection. So this essentially is the same number as this, but normalized. So these are just weights normalized to one. All right. Um, so now that we've seen just the data structures, let's look back at this table and see what we can gain from uh, what we can see, infer, or calculate what we insights we can get. So we'll address the, these three aspects in the mathematical term, the sub-communities, any additional network metrics, global or local, that will tell us about the network. And the last one is, is sort of a special case, is we want to see how these network environment change through time or through any parameter that we choose for that environment, right? So the first thing is network metrics, as I mentioned. Uh, Metrics are usually global or local and global metrics tell us about the entire network environment as one. So I found when we did this analysis, so what you're seeing here are four networks uh, of Hadean minerals on Earth, Mars, Moon, and Vesta, right? And the, this is a summarization of all the global metrics that we ran, how dense the network is, the maximum network diameter, the degree centrality, and the between us centrality. Just glancing at these numbers, we can tell that Mars, the numbers for Mars are significantly different from Earth, Moon, and Vesta. The rest of the other three follow a very similar, you know, denseness, similar distribution, a similar behavior at a global level than Mars does. So the insight here for us is that when you look at these networks individually, you learn something from them, but when you compare them globally, you find that Earth behaves very similar to minerals on Earth behave very similar to minerals on Moon and Vesta, but Mars mineralogy, Mars's mineralogy is very significantly different. And so that really uh, spurs people to go explore the mineralogy of Mars and, and try to find out why that is so. Uh, another metric, which is a global metric that I found very useful in analyzing you know, mineral and fossil networks is called assortativity or homophily. It's a measure of how homogeneous the entire network structure is. So the higher the uh, the higher the assortativity, the more homogeneous the, the the network is, and the lower the assortativity. That means that the nodes from various groups are all interconnected, and it's it's basically you know more of a mess. So you see this uh, this sort of the uh, example that's just pulled up from Wikipedia for better illustration is that something with an assortativity of zero is very interconnected. Uh, you know, all groups are behaving, you know, in a more erratic and chaotic manner. As the assortativity increases, 
the chaos reduces and you see groups emerge like based on their homogeneity and it stays that way. So how we ended up using it was to explore again fossil networks. So we created three networks, a trilobite network, a superset of that in green called the Cambrian network, and the red was a subset of the trilobite network, a specific type of trilobite called red lichida. So, and we created three versions of these networks as well, where the edges, the relationship between the node was three different things. One, we connected the network, uh, the two fossils if they were found at the same location. Next, we connected the two fossils if they were found at, they had the same age. And the third and potentially very interesting one was connected the two nodes two fossils if they had the same taxonomy or taphonomy, which was the preservational methods, uh, the way the, uh, the fossil was preserved through time. And a summarization spider chart will show you that when they have the same age, they are highly homogeneous uh, versus, you know, say taxonomy or location information. So there's more heterogeneity in these networks and from a paleontological or from a data science perspective, it is very interesting to find trends in more heterogeneous networks to see that what kind of hierarchies exist, what kind of groups exist and why they exhibit that behavior. So this also helps us gain insights and scientific hypothesis for us to further explore these networks to make scientific discoveries. Um, the last one, it, well, I don't think this is the last one. Anyways, so we were talking about groups forming uh, in a visual manner when I showed the World Cup network example, but there are actually community detection algorithms. Uh, this can be found in iGraph as well, as I mentioned, uh, where there are methods similar to clustering that help you mathematically separate out groups in any existing network. So for example, what you see here is a chromium network. So all of these are chromium minerals and uh, they're connected based on the locality. So if they are found at the same location, you draw a line between them. So that's the connection. Um, and so we just wanted to see how these groups are divided uh, you know, mathematically, not just visually. So a few community detection algorithms exist. Uh, I'm showing an example of the walk track algorithm. Uh, the walk track, walk track algorithm works on the basic principle that you start at a random node and then you take random walks across the network. And so for example, this is one random walk, right? And so the more random walks you take that keep encompassing the same set of nodes are likely to land in the same group. So if you take a walk trap algorithm and you say that this type of random walk, these nodes keep occurring in multiple random walks, then they belong in the same group here. Similarly, you're able to find four groups existing based on this walk trap algorithm in a chromium network. Again, so what the question is, how is this helpful? What insight can we gain? So what we found when we examined these networks and we examined the data behind this, the mineralogical data that existed for these chromium minerals was that these groups corresponded to the parigenetic mode of these minerals. So parigenetic mode talks about how these minerals were formed, when they were formed and so on. So it's a classification scheme that existed uh, that mineralogists made. So we found that if chromium networks exhibit grouping based on parigenetic mode, we can test it out for other similar minerals. And so we took that and ran with it and found insights. Uh, of course, in, uh, in my slide deck, everything that we, we found that was significant has been published and the paper information will be on the slide as well. So feel free to look up those papers and read them. Uh, the last example was what I was talking about, uh, which was the sentence below, which was how a mineral network changes over time. So what you what you see here is a network that I created, uh, which is a little small to see, but what you see is a countdown of time starting from four and a half billion years ago, and it will go down to zero to now. And what you see is a network of cobalt minerals, right? So let me get to a period of more activity. And so as each mineral occurs on earth for the first time, you'll see a new node added into the network. 
and every time a new node is added into the network the network has to resettle and form there you see a new node added it has to resettle and readjust to its layout and so what this tells us is how minerals have cobalt minerals have evolved through time and how the entire network environment is affected by the addition or the deletion of one mineral so uh, we're, we're around 2500 million years so 2.5 billion years and you see that still sulfur is playing a very central role in the cobalt minerals but around this time is when the global oxygenation event occurred and there was a sudden rise in minerals that used oxygen in their formation rather than sulfur and so as you keep going you will see the number of minerals significantly increase and you will see sulfur as a node move further out and oxygen and hydrogen move further central to the network meaning that the influence of sulfur in this network environment has reduced greatly over time because of the global oxygenation event and the influence of hydrogen and oxygen has increased as they move further central to them. Uh, it's a fairly long video, so I'm just gonna skip through it. But as you see now, oxygen has moved far more central and you see sulfurs gradually moving out as new minerals keep getting added. Also, you see that the closer we get to modern ages, mineral activity is far higher. And so minerals are added far more rapidly than you saw earlier. So the last thing, and I think it's, it's I, I've just taken about half an hour exactly for this. I had kept these very, very simplistic examples on Jupyter Notebooks for how to highlight, how to, how to create these networks. So I'll just run through them fairly quickly, but if anyone has any questions, uh, I can look at them in more detail um, during the question answer session. So what you see here is just like a Jupyter Notebook using R. And so you, I, I use the iGraph package, as I mentioned before. So you read the data that was extracted from the network, uh, from the knowledge graphs, right? And then you create this table of, so I, I'm simply creating uh, an adjacency matrix as I'd shown earlier. So you, you use the graph adjacency mode to create an undirected graph and you can plot the first very simplistic version of that network. What we see here is a very redundant network with self loops and double connections and so on. So you can simplify the network to remove any redundant loops and you see this kind of network with a layout. So there are patterns that exist here as well. Uh, you can run a different community detection algorithm. This one is Lovain algorithm and see how these are grouped. So you again see three groups that are formed mathematically and so you can further look into these groups as to why this group is formed. You can run local metrics like betweenness for each and every node. And you see that the nodes that have a very high betweenness connect multiple of these communities together and they, they are very important. And uh, talking about iGraph and why I like it, uh, it handles data structures really well and you can use packages like Intergraph to switch between different visualization packages for the same data object. So you can see like when you plot with a different uh, visualization package, you can still work because R is very versatile in this manner. Uh, so that's about it for my talk. Uh, I am happy to answer questions, comments, anything that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna Ruth. Um, we have on the uh, chat uh, some things that questions and comments that people have put in, but I see on the chat that John Soa has his hand raised, so perhaps we'll start with his question or comment. All right, let me just go, go over to the chat. There we go. There you go. Okay, so we, now we have two, but uh, we can start with John. If we, uh, John, can you... Okay, uh, uh, I'm uh, here. And uh, well, one question that I've uh, been asking is, uh, how do the knowledge graphs differ from any other kind of graphs that people have used? For example, Allegro graph has been is a package that's been around for a, some time and they have all sorts of graph processing. What do knowledge graphs offer that's different from or the same as uh, that package? Uh, there are many other packages. The uh, <clears throat> Uh, chemists have been in the forefront of graph processing since the 1980s. They had 
uh, since the organic molecules are huge graphs, they have uh, <clears throat> a huge ar arrangement of different kinds of technology that has been used for graphs since the 1980s. And I wondered whether any of the technology that they have developed is different from or better than or uh, used with the knowledge graphs. And what particular feature of knowledge graphs is useful here? Is it uh, that you're using it as an intermediate between, uh, say, ordinary language and uh, your processing? Or is it uh, just uh, a buzzword that you just use to attach to whatever graphs that you happen to be using? Sure. OK. So that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, and it kind of helps me make an important point that I wanted to make during the talk. Uh, so the term knowledge graph, uh, I, none, of the, none of the networks that I showed you along here are at all a knowledge graph. What I'm using as a knowledge graph is basically an ontology and its instances. And the knowledge graph is not at all used in any way for this analysis that I presented. Instead, I am extracting the data from the knowledge graph. Uh, you could even call like if you don't want to consider it a knowledge graph you can still consider it a knowledge base i am extract uh, i'm extracting the data from the knowledge base of an ontology to then use in other non ontological non knowledge base i mean there's there seems to exist this this big divide between uh, you know more traditional machine learning and more traditional ontology what, what we're doing here is just bridging that gap is to use the data extracted from ontologies uh, and use them for analysis. So what we're calling this is just a network. It's just a graph theory network. Those are the network examples that I've shown you. So what I'm using a knowledge graph is to get the data and the relationship information, and then I will process it into the data structures that I showed you. And then I use that in the manner that I showed you during this talk to gain insights. Does that answer your question? Also, uh, so I'm not using Sparkle or Allegra graph. Uh, if I use Sparkle, it would be purely for uh, getting the triples and then exporting them into the right format for me to process my data for the visualizations. Okay, That's well, this seems to be similar to what many people have done. They just say that, well, the term knowledge graph is a convenient buzzword that happens to be popular at the moment. So they just stick that on as a label to what they have been doing all along. And uh, the word happens to change from time to time that used to be called semantic networks. And then they call yeah. it many Google different kinds. And call it it's really graph just in 2012. And uh, we have a, a ton of papers which are basically trying to define what a knowledge graph is. And I, okay. I've, I've also read those papers and they seem to keep redefining it as what we know as an ontology. Yeah. I think it is worth noting that you're really using the, some of the knowledge that's in the, in the knowledge graph at the source. Yes. And essentially that, that gives you insights into that knowledge. What I'm trying to do here, and the reason I'm using knowledge graph as a term, not only because it's popular now, but also I'm trying to extract facets of the knowledge graph, parts of the knowledge graph into separate networks. So one single network, any single network that I presented will not show the entire, all the information in the knowledge graph. You have to view it in a faceted manner. There's a lot of information in every ontology, every knowledge graph that needs to be analyzed by itself first to find out these hidden patterns. And then you will link it to the other data that exists in the other parts of the knowledge graph. Okay, I see that Ravi has his hand up. Uh, next, perhaps we can have him. Uh, yes, um, Anirudh, the very good talk. But can you go to slide number two on your talk and tell us uh, what you just said is that you are using only few links out of the bottom part of the uh, graph that you show in the second slide. That's right. So, so just, just an example, right? So if you have all of the mineralogical data, so you have lots of geological information embedded in that data. So you might have information regarding the minerals geochemistry, the minerals age, 
you might have redox information, luster, hardness, any geological property that they see fit. So when, when I convert, say, a knowledge graph into a network, the network in the way that I use the term, then I first look at only the uh, location information. So you can only take at this point one, uh, one property or one relationship. So you have a SPO triple. And so you can look at one P for many S's and O's at a time uh, to create these networks. And just with that, you're able to get these insights. Right. So that's what I meant about taking a small part of the graph, small part of the knowledge graph, and then extracting the data that lies in that and then using it for network science approaches to gain insights. So, uh, particularly interesting was your uh, mention, I mean, use of the time, mm -hmm. arrow of time, namely yeah. how elements evolved on the earth uh, in its okay. history and cycle as, mm -hmm. as well as type of chemicals That's right. uh, using that I was thinking could you distinguish through this you know like a narrow neck kind of mechanism the industrial era how it influenced the carbon balance etc as compared to what was naturally occurring as a change in carbon cycle you you very well might I have seen uh... This approach is pretty popular. This or, you know, the more video that more of the kind of the video that I showed people are using it. I do know that people are using it for climate change based application. So when they view climate as a complex network, they uh, each node represents a new addition of a new factor that triggers changes in our climate. And they're showing what trigger was uh, most influential in, you know, increase or significant increase of temperatures or melting of uh, polar ice caps and so on. So I've seen it used in that regard. So what you suggested might very well be possible. I haven't come across it or read papers about it, but yeah, it is, it is very possible. Uh, similar would be the case for biodiversity. Absolutely. So uh, what I didn't present here, there's a lot of work we're doing uh, on the DTDI, Deep Time Data Infrastructure Project that uh, Gary mentioned earlier. Uh, so the goal of that is the, to prove the coevolution of the geosphere and biosphere. We're seeing biological evolution and geological evolution uh, go hand in hand and events happening in each other influence them. So we're trying to quantify it and prove that. And so we looked at biodiversity, we looked at micro, microbial networks, we looked at protein networks, which is these microbes use these proteins uh, to metabolize and that in turn results in these minerals formation of these minerals and so on So we've been examining that as well uh, uh, I'd love to talk about it, but just you know 30 minutes was too short. I guess <laughs> Yes, uh, I mean Janet I yield to you in a second, but uh, prior to that last question if you didn't use sparkle and allegro graph mm -hmm. you used R Mm -hmm. which is a statistics oriented language i believe right. Right. and machine learning language did you do something equivalent to sparkle and allegro graph no no we didn't uh, we we really wanted to like fo we didn't fo this was not focused on building any tools that help us do that so we simply we had like we can use fuseki or uh, sparkle like we just use sparkle to extract the data and we didn't we just use that data in r directly so uh, nothing of the sort direct use of the direct data use. sets yes. direct use of the data sets and um, so and part, how did you distinguish between link and a node right namely so, multiple multiple uh, relations in one right. node right uh, so like i said when we convert uh, let's call it let's when we convert a knowledge graph into a network we only look at one relationship at a time so one property at a time uh, so we chose a link to represent that one property that we chose and the nodes basically represent all the instances of the classes that are in the ontology. Uh, so it's not out yet, but uh, I'm currently writing up a more generalized formalism for this conversion. 
so that it'll be much more concrete and on paper for people to read. So we have a logical formalism for how we convert, uh, say, a knowledge graph into a network object, as I've described it. Uh, the, thank the, you. Very the, good work. Thank you. I will yield to Janet because she has been waiting. Janet took her hand down, uh, so I'm not sure if she still wants to comment. Um, I must have done that inadvertently. Um, yeah, so uh, this is very nice, very um, clean, impressive. Um, and it actually, I uh, watching this and thinking about John's question there, I made the connection, which I had not explicitly made with John Warfield's work, where in the 70s, he started talking about um, model exchange isomorphism, mm -hmm. that one can go between a logical uh, representation and a um, network representation mm -hmm. and a matrix representation. And yeah. each one of those has different advantages. And it's right. not that um, you know, any is superior, but actually the, the fact that all the rep representations can be um, used together in a modeling mm -hmm. effort is is the advantage because each one of them has um, particular pros and cons. The um, obviously communicating new insights to people uh, is best in the graphic form mm -hmm. and um, uh, manipulating the um, data um, mathematically so that you can get um, derived insights or identify um, communities as you said um, that's done in the matrix form. Um, the, uh, and you, when you start, he was interested in, um, in particular in group modeling efforts in uh, trying to um, bring people together to uh, develop a common insight into a complex problem. Um, he started out as a uh, electrical engineer, PhD, um, and he was working at Patel and um, became interested in how um, people, how much trouble people had communicating in particular about complex problems. So he um, used some techniques uh, uh, from his training in trying to help people um, develop what he called, um, uh, well, he, he developed a method called interpretive structural modeling. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, I think this is exciting because it's to some extent people have not really built on his insight from so long ago. Uh, no, and wait. It should be, that should be one generic. Of the things that, John, that can, one I, of the can things I finish that, what I'm saying? Okay, John, sure. Saying? Yeah. Okay. So, if, so now we're at a point where we can say, oh, the, the, the fact that we can go back and forth between representations is, is the answer. And the, the, with the whole idea of knowledge graphs are just lightweight semantic technology, Yes, and that's that's the answer there too. The fact that we're we're just getting more mature and uh, we're but, using but, the available technology. But we were that mature in the 1970s. In the 1970s, oh, no, the no, database no, no, no. people had conceptual schema that was independent of any representation whatsoever. And of course, all I yes, see here yeah, is fine. that I'm not saying I'm not saying that he's the only one who had that idea. I, I'm yeah, he actually, but I'm not. He wrote his own software. He wrote his own software so that he could. Uh, work with groups, and it's still available um, in DOS form, um, and other people I know who are, are working on it in open source form, um, and various companies use it in no, proprietary no. form. But the, yeah, the point I, I, is to make that to make that insight that the that you're talking about. People had those insights in the 70s. Well, why haven't we all? shifted that's to because they what, don't read the literature they the 1970s fine. the work on the conceptual schema was fantastic and it's been downhill all the way and now they're rediscovering I, what people did in the 70s okay I this agree. is not new no but but that's actually i think that's the answer the fact that it's not new is exciting I think that it's, it's <laughs> the, good to get Well, the, it's exciting it's in the sense that people are suddenly discovering that uh, re, just renaming the things that 
we had in the 70s, the conceptual schema work through the 70s and 80s was uh, excellent work. And uh, people just say, oh, well, the libraries throw out anything that's uh, five years, uh, if it's more than five years uh, old, they just don't read it anymore. And they're just rediscovering the thing. So the whole idea of the conceptual schema is that the internal rep presentation of the data, the way it's stored, is totally irrelevant to the semantics. And your semantics is at a level that is independent of any kind of representation. It doesn't matter whether it's a graph or a table or anything. This work was very well developed. I agree with you. And I, I th the problem is what we have now, what we have now, though, is we actually have, because we have the internet and because we have um, these ideas coming to the fore and people getting excited about them, what we should be doing is saying, this is wonderful. This is a chance to rediscover these core ideas from the 70s. I think of that's, course. Yeah. That is, and the thing I that's important that's is to tell people, look, if you want to find out, the, the work in the 70s and 80s was very well established. It was well formalized, and uh, there was a huge amount of work there. And they had uh, relation, uh, they would relate relational databases to network databases to hierarchical databases. And, uh, and all of them were at, an, uh, at, an, at a logical level that was independent of any representation. And all you see today is just a huge amount of re reworking the stuff in the past without really uh, even uh, putting anything further on it. And uh, Ravi was asking about standardizing. Well, guess what? People had been standardizing this stuff in the 70s and the 80s. And what happened was that uh, the companies that had proprietary technology did not want to use standards because the standards would enable, would, uh, what they want to do is force people to use their technology and they want to prevent people from using standards because standards would allow people to migrate away from their technology onto competitors. And so the problem is the sure. vendors, the vendors don't want standards because, or they undermine the standards because they want to lock people into their technology. I yes definitely and I don't think we should tell people they should go back and read the literature from the 70s and 80s. Well I I want to I want to rub their noses in it because they got to yeah, go back and say look I know you do but how about instead in our communique we we summarize the insights from the 70s and we we present it to them in a you know a compact form where they can um where they can see the the history of this I agree completely with you I just think that that we have an opportunity here to um, to Hello, distill. Johnny? Yeah. This is uh, Gary. Gary, uh, yes. I'm, we're getting I'm a little thinking, off topic here. So, Gary. Uh, yes. I, I think we're going to have a synthesis session in a couple of uh, weeks, and uh, the, some of that strategy could be incorporated here. I had my hand up because I wanted to uh, ask a, a simple question, Anna Ruth. Um, mm -hmm. I saw it comes back to the idea of the uh, edges, the predicates, mm -hmm. or the relationships. And you you talk about uh, using one at a time, but I wanted to see if I understood that you essentially are looking at three. At least three seem to be featured. One is time, one is spatial relationships, and the other is taxonomy or how is it how the uh, the mineral or the fossil is identified. Uh, are there more, or is that the is that the right set? Uh yeah, for the ones I presented today, it'd be time, it'd be location, it would be preservational methods. Uh, we have also looked at based on uh, networks based on geochemistry. We've also looked at them in economic geology based on tonnage and economic, you know, how economically valuable they are. Uh, we've done we've done this work with uh, quite a lot of people, you know. So different different organizations are interested in different aspects of it. But yeah, those three are like fundamental yeah. too. Yeah, I think a number of us have appreciated the, in, as part of your presentation being able to see how some of the uh, analysis tools and approaches are more sophisticated than perhaps we had before. This is an opportunity to use some of the large data that we have in knowledge graphs uh, to understand something in a way that's, uh, I think that's a, a key point. Right, um, right. That, that would be helpful. Also, I see um, a comment from Chris saying the links to the Jupyter Notebook take you to a password protected page. Yes, uh, unfortunately, they are password protected right now, but I will send it, uh, send a copy of the Jupyter Notebooks around through Gary uh, so that he can put it up on the site for you guys to use. Uh, yeah. 
right. Yeah, and by the way, I don't want to uh, downplay the work that's been done. I think the, the, the work that uh, you presented here is good work in that you're using a lot of new technology and applying it to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the problems. But the point that's important when we talk about standards, there have been standards uh, projects, uh, the conceptual schema work from ANSI uh, Spark from 1978. There was the ISO uh, uh, standard for conceptual uh, schemas in the uh, uh, 19, uh, that was uh, 1987. And then there was a uh, final technical report from ISO in 1999. And what happened is that uh, the word uh, database and conceptual schema got pushed out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, headlines because the semantic web was the hot new thing and so all the work that was done before was totally ignored. And the point is that there has been this work and it's uh, actually very good work and if, and people are just redoing it. Now, there, it's true that the data now is much, much larger, but nothing as far as language or logic has changed. The only thing is uh, have new technology that deals with much larger amounts of data. It's important to recognize the size and the efficiency problems. Those are extremely important. But when we talk about standards, there have been standards that people have developed for these things based on, in fact, uh, Tom Steele, one of the guys from AT&T said way back, the only logical uh, standard for, the only logical solution for uh, standardization is logic. And it's all logic underneath it. And then you have different kinds of tools, statistical and uh, approximations and all sorts of things. But underneath it all, logic hasn't changed since the days of Aristotle. People have discovered more, but the, uh, the, when you look at these uh, hierarchies of on these ontologies, they aren't going anywhere beyond Aristotle. And so it's not really that it's new, it's just that people haven't done the homework. So if I might interject before we turn to Janet, uh, as a way of explaining to Anna Ruth with part of what is going on, I think, is that we write a, uh, a communique at the end of our uh, a long summit, and we have a symposium at the end. And, uh, and so some of this discussion, it provides context within which we'll be discussing things. So that's part of what is going on here. So I, we are rapidly approaching the hour. So let me turn it to Janet and uh, see what she has to say. Yeah, hi. OK, good. Thanks. Um, the, so I, I was. I'm trying to respond to John's concern, and we understand his frustration. And uh, but I, this is partly why I wanted to have our backward-looking um, part of the knowledge graph discussion as context for looking at what's going on now, because things are very similar to what was talked about, um, you know, half a century ago. But things have changed a lot, and this is exciting. And Anirudh's work is. An example of that. It's a nice clean example of that, that when you bring together the domain experts and the available data and the current technology, you can leverage these insights. The, the, the reality of what you can do with models has not changed, but you can leverage these things in, in wonderful ways. So I'm just, I'm really pleased to see this. I think it was a good, um, as I keep saying, a nice clean way to show what you can do. So thanks for that. Okay, so this is Gary again. We're approaching the hour, and I'm not sure uh, how long we'll go on, but I did want to mention that next week our speaker will be Hako Nathan, who will talk about rich context knowledge graphs. Um, and uh, he, uh, I, I heard him speak on this topic, uh, so we'll learn about projects, but we'll also learn a bit about how uh, machine learning is used as uh, working with the data available off of knowledge graphs. So let me uh, let me see. Does anybody else have any? comments either spoken or on the, uh, the chat that uh, we want to consider or uh, Anna Ruth might want to uh, comment on? All I say is that I have seen a lot of new information today, new ways of depicting information today. So I want to thank Anna Ruth and such similar efforts by other researchers. Yes, this was a nice insight into some things. But I see Todd has his hand up here. Yes, um, uh, two, two questions. One, what were your data source, sources? And you made reference to either one or more ontologies. You showed one in your slides, but were there others that were used? That's it. 
Okay, uh, so the first part of the question was, uh, so our data sources for the minerals were Mindat uh, and uh, Rough database. Um, and for the fossils were PBDB, Paleo uh, Biological Data Set database. Uh, so there are no, so the ontology for both of these things are under development. Uh, so they're not out there, they're not published yet uh, because, you know, ontologies are they're just not common in that community so all we got was either their sql data or just a dump of files so that's still ongoing uh, the data set that i showed was developed by us uh for for nasa so that's the only that's why that's the only one i showed but i wanted to show that there is an ability to convert to get the data from the knowledge graphs and then use them for these insights. And so the insights I had, the, the methods we used were highly successful for the mineral data. So I wanted to highlight that point. Uh, so once once we do have an ontology uh, for the mineral data, I will, I will update you guys. Uh, so there is one ongoing effort uh, for this called GEMI uh, that we're doing, which is Global Earth Mineral Inventory, which uh, the information model is ready and we were using Elasticsearch for a faceted browsing aspect, but the uh, ontology itself is still currently under development. If I could insert another question here before Todd uh, has another opportunity. Uh, have you looked at all at Suite? Uh, I have, yes. And uh, have. it's it's lacks axioms. I'm wondering if your work is going to be coordinated or aligned with Suite in some way in the future. You know, this is a uh, of interest to ESA, which is trying to do yes. some of that work. So I, I have looked at Suite. Uh, it's, I think it's very valuable as a vocabulary, but you're also right in saying that it lacks axioms. Uh, uh, there will be some coordination on the terminology and the concepts, of course, uh, but we're looking at the samples and we're looking at you know, sa sample based information. So something like EarthChem uses is what we're trying to do for this global earth mineral inventory. Good. Uh, as part of ESIP, we have a, uh, what's called a semantic harmonization uh, cluster that's doing some work. And uh, perhaps we, we, we can uh, stay in touch on this because it, it might be of a, a mutual interest to work together on that. Right. Um, and Todd has his hand up. Todd, you still have a comment or a question? Sorry, I star six. I Todd star uh, six. Uh, a follow-on question: You mentioned ontologies under development. Are they going to be aligned to any particular foundational ontology, and/or is there a particular methodology that de they're developing or are using to for development? Uh, I am not aware of that as of yet. I'm not like working on that actively, but uh, in our lab at Tetherless World, we do have an ontology development methodology that uh, you know people have been using for decades, and uh -oh. uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna align to. I mean, I I I I'm not the expert to answer this question, so please don't quote me on any of this. Um, okay, but. I think we, we're just going to align to the existing uh, ontologies for all the terminologies. So Sweets, which I know is a predominantly popular one uh, in the earth sciences, is definitely an attempt to be used. Sweet yeah. has, has lots of ontological problems, and there's lots of confusions mm -hmm. in there. So you should need to be careful. I will. OK. Thank you. Thank you. One quick one for Anirudh. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah. Uh, that is, how do you align different domains' meanings mm -hmm. to mean the same thing in your depictions? Say a <laughs> node yeah, coming that's... from two different communities. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's extremely hard. Uh, there is no single answer I can give you that has even worked for me. So we've been just dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, <laughs> at least from... The, the computer science or the data science perspective on these things, how we use our terminology, we are making it amply clear with all of the definitions, all of everything that we know is standardized, at least in the field of 
computer science, the data science, or network science, we are relaying that information. But it's it's been a hard road, and you know, you it's you, a you hard finally... road that people have been working on for the past sixty years, and they're still at the same point. They don't know what to do. I guess so. Yeah, but there still isn't a single answer. So. No, but uh, the, but the point that I keep making is that ordinary language is what people use to uh, negotiate things among one another, and the important thing is to be able to carry on a dialogue so all explanations are represented in some way in ordinary language, and we ha always have to be able to carry on a dialogue with a follow-up question so that you can hone down the way people un uh, align their own ontologies between one another is to have a dialogue where you keep drilling down yes and no and question. You can't just ask one single question. You have to drill down in a dialogue in order to make sure, sure that you pin down every significant concept. And that's the problem that we'll have to deal with before we can have computers that can negotiate. You have to be able to negotiate follow on questions and drill down in order to recognize them and that's still a natural language processing problem this, this is a, this is gary again this is not an answer but it is a, a point about direction so uh, um unlike sweet the envo uh, ontology which is for an environmental one has been working pretty uh steadily on incorporating much better domain definitions uh, as part of their annotation and documentation of particular concepts so in, in addition to having a richer set of axioms and suite, it also has a much richer uh, definitional uh, uh, information for people, for humans to understand. And it also, beyond that, has links back to domain uh, vocabularies where these things are discussed as part of harmonization efforts. So in the cryosphere, that is to say, Arctic and cold and, and things like glaciers, uh, th that community has worked hard to take a variety of, of uh, vocabularies and resolve how they work together and identify where there are issues. And the ENVO uh, uh, ontology now links back to that so that you understand what has been agreed to and what is still under discussion. I very strongly agree, and I would emphasize that there is a whole field of study called terminology, and terminologists have been working and very actively for over a century. This is the a work on standardizing terminologies for all the sciences and every specialty is a very important area. There are professional terminologists at places like the United Nations and the European Union and also every every scientific organization of any kind, like the uh, uh, psychologists have their, their uh, DSM manual that for, of all of the disorders, of uh, mental disorders. The, you, every field of study has a terminology and the work on the ordinary language of, talk, of people talking to one another and ironing out those uh, terminologies, that is prior to any kind of axiomatized formalism, that the natural language understanding among the people and the specialists in the area comes first and the formalization comes afterwards. You can't start with the axioms, you end up with the axioms. That, that's largely true, although uh, some of the axioms uh, developed in one area can provide guidance on how to axiomize definitions in other areas that, have, that people haven't spent Time, so absolutely absolutely and the uh, and the most general of all axiom systems is mathematics mathematics is the is the study of every possible set of axioms and their their consequences mathematics is the queen of the sciences mathematics is come comes first and you can't get around mathematics and I treat formal logic as a subset of mathematics. The idea of saying that logic is the foundation for mathematics, that's a bad idea because the point is that there are more variations of, of logics than there are, uh, and, and that you can't pick any single one of those. The idea is that mathematics comes first, logic is a special case of mathematics, and mathematics is the foundation for relating everything 
after you have already decided what it means in ordinary language. I see that we're well over the hour, so I want to thank Anna Ruth for uh, his presentation and his, his ability to uh, guide us uh, and answer some of our questions. So I think with that, uh, Ken, I think we're going to conclude this, uh, this session and look forward to uh, Paco and Nathan's discussion. I think that uh, people should tune into that. I think it's going to be very enjoyable also as, as this one was.